Hello and welcome. My name's Zach. I'm currently working as a medical registrar in a London hospital fighting COVID-19. And this video is intended as an introduction for medical students volunteering on the wards during this pandemic. Hopefully it will relate what you're seeing back to the clinical science you need for your exams this summer. Regarding COVID-19, all that follows is based purely on my own experience and the expertise of the consultants um, that I've been working with. It reflects our local practice, which will be different from elsewhere, and it's definitely not intended as medical advice for patients or for relatives. So, let's get started. Um, we'll begin with the terminology. Coronavirus disease 19, or COVID-19 for short, refers to the disease caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2 to its friends. The virus was previously referred to as the novel coronavirus, or as the Wuhan virus, from where it originated. It's a single-stranded RNA virus that predominantly spreads person to person via droplets. Now, we're not going to talk too much about spread today, as I want to focus on what the virus looks like clinically. Once someone contracts the virus, once they're infected, the incubation period is approximately five to six days, but maybe as long as 14 days, hence why Public Health England is currently recommending a 14-day isolation period for household contacts of confirmed cases, to give these people time to present and show their symptoms. The most common symptoms we're seeing are fever and a dry cough. <coughs> we're also seeing a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms, mostly diarrhea, while others who've had the virus describe severe unrelenting fatigue, widespread myalgia, bad headaches, and a loss of the sense of smell. For many people, these symptoms settle within about a week. But for others, it can take as long as two weeks to start feeling better. At the time of recording, I'm on day 11, and I'm still feeling pretty tired. For others, things will take a turn between day 7 and day 10, which is between 12 and 16 days after the initial exposure. These patients develop COVID-19 pneumonia, where the virus begins to affect the lungs themselves. COVID pneumonia leaves patients' lungs so heavily damaged they are unable to get enough oxygen into the bloodstream. These patients are hypoxic. That's where we come in. These are the patients that we're seeing on the medical take. They present to hospital with a history of increasing shortness of breath. After a week of these fevers and flu-like symptoms, often the shortness of breath is worse on exertion. Examination-wise, we're not using stethoscopes to prevent the risk of cross-contamination, but an ABC examination typically reveals evidence of respiratory distress and hypoxia. Oxygen saturations measured via a finger probe are usually lower than 94% on room air, often much lower, while the respiratory rate is usually much higher than the 20 breaths per minute we normally see. Obviously, these findings aren't specific to COVID-19. Bacterial pneumonias and pulmonary emboli could both look similar, and that's where our investigations come in. The two frontline investigations we're using most commonly in the emergency department are a blood lymphocyte count and a chest X-ray. Lymphopenia, a low lymphocyte count, is very common in COVID-19 and is seen in the majority of patients we're admitting. With regards to the chest X-ray, the classic appearance is one of bilateral pneumonia with extensive, predominantly peripheral, ground glass changes. Now we're confident that the patients presenting with the typical history, lymphopenia, and these classic x-ray changes probably have COVID-19, and we'll usually treat them as such even before we have the confirmatory of swab results back. A note on swabs. The swab is a nasopharyngeal sample, which we send to the lab for a polymerase chain reaction test, a PCR. It's a yes or a no test, but we don't get the results back for sometimes 24 or even 48 hours. Hence the need to make decisions based on the rapidly available tests we already have. More importantly, while very specific for COVID-19, the sensitivity of these swabs isn't perfect. And we've seen about a 20% false negative rate in some places. That means if we test 10 patients who have COVID-19, Two of them will have negative swabs, despite having the disease. So we must interpret these swabs cautiously, along with the rest of the clinical picture. A CT of the chest is the gold standard for diagnosis. 
Unfortunately, scanning everyone who walks through the door would be a great way to infect those who don't already have the disease. So at our hospital, we're only using it for patients where the diagnosis isn't clear from the clinical picture, bloods, x-ray and swabs. So let's say we've got a patient we're pretty sure is COVID based on the above. What do we do next? Well, the first decision to make is whether or not they need to come in. And to make this decision, we've been using their oxygen saturations. If someone is saturating above 94% on room air and is able to safely move around without desaturating, we'll probably send them home. If their sats are lower than this cutoff, we'll probably admit them. Obviously, there are exceptions. For example, patients who have a lower saturation target range, those with COPD, for example. For those who we do admit, a typical plan would include respiratory isolation, send COVID swabs, cover with antibiotics if concerned about bacterial infections, target saturations of 90 to 94 percent, wean oxygen down as able, and aim home once weaned off oxygen. It's worth noting that there is no direct treatment for COVID-19, at least not yet. We're just providing the support and the oxygen the lungs need to keep going while the body recovers from the infection. So what's next? Well, the everyday management of inpatients suffering from COVID-19 largely comes down to how much oxygen we're giving them and how much of it is getting through to the bloodstream. The amount of oxygen we're giving is measured as the fraction of inspired oxygen, FiO2. Basically, how much oxygen is there in the gas they're breathing in? For example, room air contains 21% oxygen. If we're providing extra oxygen, this percentage will be higher. We measure how much of it is in the bloodstream using pulse oximetry. The saturations probe giving us a number that we then aim to keep between 90 and 94%. If it drops below 90, we increase what we're giving. If it rises above 94%, we'll wean it down a little. So with this in mind, you can see that it's critical to understand just what FiO2 you're providing to the patient. That's why we're using Venturi devices as, unlike Hudson masks, they provide a fixed rate of oxygen. We know how much we're giving. Venturi devices are color coded by how many liters of oxygen they need to run and what percentage of oxygen they provide the patient. Blue requires two liters to provide 24%. White requires four liters to provide 28%. Yellow requires 8 litres to provide 35%. Red requires 10 litres to provide 40%. Green requires 15 litres to provide 60%. By contrast, 15 litres via a non-rebreathe mask provides an FiO2 of approximately 80 to 90% thanks to its reservoir bag full of concentrated oxygen. So you can see how knowing the device used is critical. A patient requiring 15 litres via non-rebreathe mask is doing quite a bit worse than someone requiring 15 litres via Venturi. Now, each Venturi device has its flow rate and FiO2 written on it, but it's useful to have a reference guide to hand, so here's a screenshot that you can snap if you'd like. Patients requiring very high flows, 60% or higher, may require escalation to higher forms of treatment. These are the ones that we worry about. Now we're not going to cover ceilings of care and treatment escalation discussions today, but that's obviously a really critical part of managing this pandemic. We'll probably cover it in a different video. Clinically, the first thing you will see us do for patients requiring very high FiO2s is to place them in the prone position, or as our paediatric colleagues like to call it, tummy time. This opens up the posterior and inferior aspects of the lungs and, through some complex physiology I won't pretend to perfectly understand, can dramatically improve patient saturations quite rapidly. A patient who is prone on 80% FiO2 and only just making their saturations with a respiratory rate of 40, well, they're still in trouble and we need to give them a little bit more help. For us, at the moment in our hospital, this usually means CPAP. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. It involves a tight-fitting mask being placed over the patient's face to provide additional pressure. But why does this help? Well, to understand that, you need to understand the mechanics of breathing in the healthy patient. As I'm sure you'll all know, in spontaneous ventilation, the diaphragm contracts and falls, while the rib cage moves up and out. Both increase the intrathoracic volume. As a result of this, the intrathoracic pressure falls 
relative to the pressure outside the body. Air follows this concentration gradient, flowing into the lungs through the trachea. This is normal inspiration. When these muscles of ventilation then relax, the intrathoracic volume falls as the lungs recoil to their resting position. The pressure inside the lungs rises, pushing the air back out again. This is normal expiration. Now as you can see, spontaneous ventilation relies on negative pressure, and that works just fine in a healthy pair of lungs. However, in a lung damaged by COVID-19, atelectasis is a major problem. Many of the alveoli have collapsed, decreasing the surface area available for gas exchange, and making it more difficult to get oxygen into the bloodstream. That's where CPAP comes in. In addition to providing high flows of oxygen, CPAP provides a continuous, positive pressure, holding those alveoli open and recruiting more lung for the work of oxygenation. Stay open. Remember, patients on CPAP are still awake and breathing for themselves. They're still generating a negative pressure gradient for ventilation. The difference here is that the continuous positive pressure prevents the lungs going negative at the end of expiration ensuring alveoli stay open rather than collapsing and increasing the surface area available for gas exchange. Now, while CPAP has allowed us to avoid intubation in some patients, for many patients CPAP is just a bridging measure, delaying, if not preventing, the need for invasive ventilation. Invasive ventilation is what happens on intensive care. It requires us to take over the work of breathing entirely. Patients sick enough to need this are first given medication to put them to sleep, then medications to paralyse them. An endotracheal tube is placed through the larynx into the trachea. This tube is then attached to a ventilator. So how does a ventilator work? Well, to put it simply, the ventilator alternates between two pressures. The higher pressure, known as the peak pressure, creates a positive gradient between the ventilator and the lungs pushing air into the lungs in inspiration. The pressure then drops to allow for expiration, but it doesn't drop to zero. It stays slightly positive. This lower pressure is known as the PEEP, the positive end expiratory pressure, and it acts similarly to CPAP, making sure the alveoli stay open to do their job. Mechanical ventilation is positive pressure ventilation, essentially the opposite of what the body does physiologically, negative pressure ventilation. In its most basic terms, the healthy patient sucks, while ventilators blow. Again, ventilation is not a treatment. It's merely a way to support the body and lungs while the patient fights the infection. We won't talk too much about intensive care level care today, mostly because I'm a medical registrar, so it's not my area of expertise. Uh, patients who recover up there and are extubated successfully are stepped down to the ward. Uh, they are typically still requiring high flows of oxygen. As with patients who did not require intensive care, the aim is to wean down the oxygen until they are safe on room air alone. They are then ready to be discharged. I think that's all we're going to cover today, but I just had one final note about how different people respond to the virus. Let's imagine 100 people get COVID-19. Up to 20 may experience no symptoms at all. Another 60 may experience only mild symptoms and not need to see a doctor. About 20 will be sick enough to need hospital care. Five may need critical care and one may die. As a student volunteer, you will only see the 20 people who get unwell. You will remember the five who get critically unwell and you will never forget the one who dies. This is going to be difficult. Please remember that we're all in this together and that it's okay not to be okay. So, hope you found this video useful, and once again, thank you so much for giving your time to help us keep our patients safe. Stay well.